Welcome to the Disruptive Entrepreneur Podcast. For anyone who wants to make money and make a difference, grow and leverage your enterprise better, get more done in less time, outsource everything and create your ideal lifestyle. And now, your host, eight times best-selling author and double world record holder, Rob Moore. Hi, it's Rob Moore here and welcome to the Disruptive Entrepreneur podcast, also videocast, also live feed. I feel a bit overwhelmed <laughs> with all this stuff going on. I'm really excited to have, uh, to be interviewed, uh, Joe Valenti. Uh, half Italian, is that right? Half Italian, that's and right. Did yeah. I get the pronunciation right? Good looking half. Oh, yeah, good, yeah. Valente. <laughs> Valente, great. So you probably know who Joe is because he won uh, the most recent Apprentice. I want to say thanks a lot for taking your time. I know you're a busy man. So, Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, great. Thanks for coming Good on. afternoon, disruptive entrepreneurs. <laughs> <laughs> All right then, so let's get straight in then. I want to yep. sort of um, just really dive in at the deep end. Fantastic. Why do you think you won The Apprentice? Um, I think I won The Apprentice because I think that Lord Chu could relate to me. I think he could see that I'm somebody that's going to be a very, very hard working individual that really wants it, that can deliver. Um, you know, and that I gave a hundred percent in every single scenario on that show, mm -hmm. every single task, even if I didn't know what I was doing each time, I always tried to learn and adapt and, and take on every situation. Yeah. And I think he could see that, you know, and mm. I think um I think he made obviously made the right choice. Well of course. Uh, <laughs> so do you think you were the best at everything on the show? Or do you think that he's not necessarily looking for the best, he's looking for someone who can try their best even if they're not the best yeah I mean I don't think I was the best at everything but I was the best all-rounder yeah um, I think I was the best at being able to deliver on a number of levels yeah. you know from endurance from listening to be able to control people to be able to deal with my customer and you know and manage the whole situation I think and I think in business from what I've learned you don't have to be a specialist in every subject you just know you just have to know how to put those people together yeah and manage those people and then that's how you get the best results sure whether it, did you play any games you know you're like trying to play people off against each other one up a bit a bit of competition any strategy yeah, I mean, I think that that's what other people tried to do, but I think my main strategy was to deliver. Yeah. It was to do what Joe could do best every mm -hmm. single time, and if I gave 100%, whatever situation it came down to, I knew that I could justify everything that I'd done, yeah. whereas other people get it mixed up. They start to focus on how they can bring somebody else down, right, not yeah. how they can excel. Like politics at the moment, basically. Yeah, exactly yeah. right, yeah. 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 So it's not you know, it's not how they can excel, they try to bring other people down, and that's mm -hmm. where they... They fall apart. Yeah. So, and do you, if I get a lot of people ask me about, oh, Brexit, yeah. oh, what's it going to do? And oh, it's the wrong time in the property mm -hmm. market. And oh, my competitor's doing this. Um, sounds like, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it sounds like you're basically saying, don't worry about what everyone else is doing. You have a plan. You stick to your plan. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. yeah. You know, and out of every bad situation comes an opportunity. Sure. You know, somebody else does something wrong, then you can you can um, yeah. capitalise off the back of that, and that's the way I see it. Sure. So you, you, you didn't get drawn much into, because I used to watch every show. Yeah. I didn't watch every show you were on. Cheers. Um, yeah, I know. Well, Thanks, mate. <laughs> if I didn't know, I don't know. <laughs> from Peterborough yeah, that. I know. Well, I was definitely fighting your corner, yeah. being a, a, a local guy. But... um. Yeah, because sometimes I can imagine you just sitting there and someone's just talking stuff about you and just want to be like, what are you talking about? Shut up. Yeah. You know, you were able to sort of stop the temptation where you were worrying about the games that other people were playing. I think what you've got to do is basically just um, just be accurate and don't bullshit. Yeah. Um, you know, and just go straight in for the points of what you've done right and what they've done wrong. Yeah. And, you know, people do get drawn into two arguments but Lord Sugar hates that yeah. as soon as you start to sort of bitch and argue he gets yeah. fed up and he just won't listen to what you say yeah. so I learned from probably the first show or the first episode to get your information out clearly yeah. and concisely and don't yeah. waffle right. and don't talk if you don't need to yeah. don't get involved in bitchy arguments just deliver yeah. people like that just want key information they want yeah. to make their decision and they want to move on which actually is a really good tip generally in business isn't it yeah. you know when you're dealing with big weeks because you know I um, Lord Sugar came and spoke at one of our events. You know, yeah, I've, yeah. I've, I've been involved in working with him. I remember the first time I met him, and it was like when you were talking, it's like you had a quarter of a second to get your point yeah. across. Otherwise, he's like gone and interrupting. Yeah, exactly. Because he's probably got a million things to think about. Yeah. 
And do you think sometimes when people make that mistake when they're sort of, you know, maybe looking to raise money or get mentors and they waffle and talk around things? And yeah, I, you know, I think that's yeah. very, very important. And I think, you know, sometimes when you're trying to, when you're trying to sell a dream, you go too much into the detail when you don't give the key bits of information. Yeah. If you're looking for an investor, sometimes they just want to know, okay, it's a good idea, it's the right numbers, and then let's do it. Let's not yeah. go ahead and just sell yeah. something that's, you know, at this moment, just a dream, as it were. Yeah, because, I mean, obviously known you from before. You yeah. To sort of, you know, not, not really well, but known of you, and obviously you've known of us, and I've always felt that you're very much to the point and mm -hmm. matter of fact. Do you think that's important? Yeah, I do. Yeah, because I'm just I just like the information and I, and I don't bullshit myself. Yeah. You know, when somebody talks to me, I just want to know what the what the point is and, yeah. and just get on with it rather than just beat around the bush. Do you think that can come across a bit hard sometimes in business if you're just key information, facts, sales? Yeah, yeah. and I think I learned a big lesson on that show. And one of them one of them was the time when we did the property task actually, and we mm. had to go and pitch to the people that were the big developers. Yeah. I went in there thinking that we were guaranteed one of these people to let us sell their property. And for me, I went in to try and see how much I was gonna get out of the situation. Mm. And I didn't realize at that time that I needed to show a little bit more interest in what that, what that um, client needed, yeah. you know? And then we ended up getting the, um, getting the developer we didn't want, which, sure. which made us lose the task. So I learned a lesson that sometimes going straight in isn't always the right way. Yeah. Yeah. But most of the time it is. Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, totally. So how much did you try and work out what Lord Sugar wants and what he's like, you know, and try and be that and deliver that when you're on the show? How much did I try and work that out? Yeah. I mean, I worked it out pretty much from day one, and yeah. then I tried to follow it from there. Yeah. Like I said, no waffling straight to the point yeah. don't get drawn into other people's arguments yeah. don't bring down other people just yeah. the sake of bringing them down yeah. if somebody did something wrong i'd pull them on it and just yeah. be straight and obvious yeah. but i didn't ever try and discredit what they'd done to try and make myself look yeah. better yeah it was always about you know looking good because i deserved to look good because yeah. i was proud of what i delivered yeah. not about making somebody else look worse so i look better sure yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so well, I use that technique yeah. from pretty much the first day when I realised, like you said, when you met him, you know, you get 30 seconds. If you're lucky. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If I say, oh, Lord Sugar, yeah, this happened, blah, yeah. blah, 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 okay, I'm finished with you now, yeah. right, you talk next. Yeah. So you just say the sentence, yeah. he doesn't care about hellos, goodbyes, how's your day been, yeah. just get the information across and shut up. Yeah. And you know what, I, I'd really like to, to sort of dig into that a bit because... Um, I think a lot of people, when they see people like that, mm -hmm. they think that's these people being rude mm -hmm. or blunt. They don't get how many diary appointments, how many meetings, how many companies they're trying to juggle, how many media appointments they're trying to juggle. And so I think if you can look at it from their point of view, they must have a load of meetings and they must have a load of information and a load of advisors, short, sweet, to the point. I think yeah. they probably, because you know, a lot of people have an opinion of Lord Sugar. I've met him, you've met him, a lot of people haven't. And I like the fact that kind of what you see is what you get and yeah, yeah, how yeah. he's on screen is how he's off screen Yeah, because a lot of people aren't like that Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah I think if you take the time to think okay so how's what's this person's life like mm -hmm. you know like we're supposed to do this at 10 you're busy you get called yeah, out yeah. can we do it at 2 yeah we can do it at 2 because mm -hmm. you're busy I don't need to be a dick about it and yeah 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 I mean, yeah, exactly right and you know they're, they're trying to process like you said before so much information mm. they only want the small chunk that's yeah. valid yeah. They don't want everything else around yeah. it, you know, and yeah. it is, it's hard, it must be, it must be crazy. Yeah. You know, my small little empire that I'm building on at the moment, mm. I struggle to find time. Yeah. But then you look back when you had one or two people working with you, I used to struggle to find time then. Yeah. So yeah. as you get bigger and bigger, you always seem to struggle to find time, but you mm. always seem to make time. Mm. And the more people you get around you obviously helps out because it takes a lot of your stuff away. Yeah. But like I said, the guy's got so much information how do you process all of that? Yeah. And it is by being short and sharp. Yeah. If you wanted to give everybody as much attention as you possibly could, you'd never get anything done at that level. Yeah, yeah. Cool, so um, can we pause a bit for the, uh, from The Apprentice? Yeah, Talk yeah. about you a bit? Yeah, yeah. Just in case people don't know the history of you, obviously they'd have seen you on TV and yeah, stuff. Yeah, but yeah. So, how old are you? So 26 now. Wow, man. Yeah, 26. Yeah, and? Nearly 27 in September. And you started your business before The Apprentice, did you? Yeah, started yeah. when I was 22. Okay. Yeah. And the business is? Is Imprigas. Okay. Um, it's a plumbing and heating business. Water yeah. installation company now. Yeah. 
Um, we, we started to install boilers all over the UK. Yeah. Um, we're basically experts in, in that one sector. And you got how many staff now? So 16 staff. Yeah. yeah. We should have around 20 by the end of the year. Yeah. Um, and yeah, we're just growing and growing, growing by county and, and just delivering sure. that customer service and delivering what we say we're going to deliver. And mm. that's the most important thing. And why did you set up that business? Why did you get into that? So bringing it right back to the beginning, when I was 15, um, I was at school and I weren't getting on very well. I couldn't learn in an academic environment yeah. and ended up getting expelled. So then after that, I needed an opportunity um, to... What did you get expelled for? Uh, it was just a number of different things, really. No, I really. didn't like being told what to do. It was probably <laughs> the most important one. Which probably makes you a good entrepreneur. Yeah, short yeah. attention span. Right. Um, wasn't <laughs> able to sit and listen for very long. I wanted to get things done. Yeah. You know, I don't like a massive amount of instruction. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it was just hard. I couldn't ever see the point of being taught things that I was never going to deliver yeah. in the in future life. Art, mm. I couldn't draw. Why mm. are you wasting an hour of my time a day yeah. making me go to art or yeah. learning about RE or you yeah. know it's always good to get the base bits mm. at primary school but then I don't want to know any more about that yeah. put me into something that I can excel in yeah so then anyway it was just all of that and I wanted to be out of school couldn't stand it yeah. so I was gone yeah. um, and then basically I was 15 and I was thinking right what am I going to do now yeah. then it, then it, the reality yeah, 15 hit home. born in Peterborough expelled that's not <laughs> a good start yeah exactly so yeah. I had one way I could go down with the rest of the people that I knew yeah. or I could go up yeah. Um, you know, and I just, I, and I always knew I was going to go up. I never, I knew being expelled from school was only a minor, yeah. a minor thing that was going to happen. Yeah. The day I walked out of there, my mum looked at me and she said, "Joe, you're going to prison." I said to her, "No, don't worry about me, mum. I'm going <laughs> up. You ain't got to worry." I yeah. said, "I promise you." Yeah. And then, um, you know, from that point, then I didn't. I needed to create an opportunity, mm -hmm. and I was stuck. I was out. I had nothing to do in the daytime, so I approached a local plumber who I knew was my best friend's cousin. He'd just turned 25 and he'd started his own business. Um, and I said to him, there's no way that he's not going to let me go and work with him if I offer my services for free. Yeah. I had the whole of year 11 to kill anyway because yeah. I didn't have nothing else to do. Mm -hmm. So I went to him and I basically said, look, I'll come with you every single day for free, okay? And I need you to teach me as much as you possibly can. Mm -hmm. and, and if you do that for me, I'll give you 100%. I'll come every single day and deliver and then you give me an apprenticeship at the end. Yeah. Okay, so I went with him, went every single day, I was never late, always wore my uniform, always polite to customers, completely different to what it was like at school, yeah. because I wanted to be there, and it was mm -hmm. something I was interested in. So I went with him, and then um, he put me through college, Great. and then time went on and on and on. Then from 18, I got qualified as a qualified plumber, yeah. and then at that point, my, um, my boss at the time, he was paying me 35 quid a day. Basically, I wanted 60 quid a day. Yeah. He said, no, I'm going to give you 50. So I'd been two years on real shit money, 80 yeah. quid a week. And then he said, no, so I quit my job, yeah. took out a six grand loan and went and studied on a gas course. Right. Um, after that, I was 19, qualified gas engineer. All of a sudden, I was making 30 grand a year, yeah. working in London. I'd had a flat, a car. So at that point, I'd done really, really well, yeah. you know, from where I'd came from. Mm. Um, then two years into plumbing and heating, I'd got bored and I thought, right, I've done all my gas qualifications now. Yeah. So I had to go off to Australia, um, went out there for six months, partied, had a great time, really enjoyed life, experienced it, mm. um, got a lot of that stuff out of my system. Then came back and then needed needed something else to um, to sink my teeth into. Yeah. And I got back into the same job. So I got Lord Sugar's autobiography for Christmas, which I spoke a lot about on the yeah. show. Yeah. Read that for three weeks straight. Yeah. And then I'd always had this spirit inside me and knew I was going to do something, but I didn't quite know how. Where do you think it's come from? Um, it's come from, mine's come from basically not having money growing up. Mm. And I had a very wealthy uncle and we were quite poor. So every time I saw my uncle, yeah. he would always have a nice car and nice things. And then I would look at what we had and I think, how can two people have such different lives? Sounds like, have you read Rich Dad, Poor Dad? I've never read, the, yeah. I've not read the whole yeah, thing. It no. sounds a bit like that, he had a rich dad and a poor dad. And, yeah. 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 So it came from that really and that was what my drive was. I thought, I'm not, I'm not having this. Mm. If he's got that, I can have exactly what he's got. Yeah. You know, so I then went chasing after that. Yeah. And then reading Lord Sugar's book, I saw how somebody came from nothing to yeah. be something that he is yeah. from an East London council estate and I thought, I can do that. So. Yeah basically decided to quit my job, took out a 15 grand loan and started a business. Right, and that was at 20... 22. 22. Yeah. It's funny, you know, because I've interviewed a lot of people mm -hmm. and um, a lot of my business partners, friends, I know some billionaires, I know Andres, Andres Paniotu well, 
and virtually every successful entrepreneur I've met, they're self-made, mm -hmm. i.e. they started from nothing. You know, often second and third generation wealth, they mm -hmm. go spray it and waste it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think a lot of people watching, they often look at the things in their life or listening. Oh, well, I can't do that and that's difficult. And they don't realize that their pains can be their motivators. Mm -hmm. Like um, Mark Homer, my business partner, he got expelled from school. Um, Neville Wright, who you, you might know, he's from Peterborough, he's mm -hmm. worth 100 odd million. He was dyslexic at school, didn't, you know, didn't do well in school, but sort of hustled and sold on the playground to make yeah. up for it. Um, and do you think maybe, don't want to put words into your mouth, because I kind of said that that seems to be a pattern, but do you think maybe where, because you lacked in school, you had something else you wanted to really prove? Yeah, exactly, yeah. I think I wanted to, I wanted to prove to myself that I could do it. Yeah. You know, and I could I could become just as wealthy as my uncle, if sure. not if not wealthier. Yeah. Just to um, you or to others as well. I think to I think to myself, I'm probably my hardest critic, but then mm. also to to my family, and then yeah. and then to everybody else that was looking in yeah. around that time. But just touching on something that you said, I think the main people, the main reason people don't achieve the things that they want, and the only thing for me is self belief. Yeah. People lack that self-belief, so they don't attempt it. Yeah. You know, when you say, I always say, when my friends say, oh, you've done brilliantly now, and you've got this, it's all right for you to say that. And I said, hang on, you've known me since I was younger, I had nothing, you know? Yeah. And a lot of these people, like you said, they don't have anything, yeah. but they have the self-belief. And if you've so got that you, self- what if you don't have it, though? Because, you know, maybe, maybe people have had a bit of a knockdown. What if people don't have self-belief? How do they get it? If, if they don't have it, then find it. You need to find some motivation. I think you really need to have a reason why. Yeah. But you have to want to change inside. Mm. You have to have a reason why. I had a reason why I wanted to be successful. Yeah. And I think about that every single day. Yeah. And if I, if I struggle to get up or I'm having a hard week or whatever, mm. that reminds me and then I carry on going. Yeah. But using you know, all different types of audio book, podcasts, mm. um, you know, all of this type of stuff and looking at other people's stories are great motivators. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you've got to do that research and, and look into it and sometimes you need that trigger yeah. Lord Sugar's book for me was that trigger yeah. I had the motivation but I needed something to turn me on mm. I needed something to flick that switch but self belief yeah. what do you think what's your main tips if they don't have the self belief how do they get it um, I think what you said about uh, get, digging deeper and finding out a why yeah. um, so at the end of the day um, most of the things you want in your life come from in my opinion mm -hmm. the voids you have like mm -hmm. you want money because your uncle's got it and you haven't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's there's a type of person that's got voids and then they get self defeated or they lose belief or I can't have that. And then there's a sort of person that goes, well, actually, minute, you know, I've experienced poverty uh, and um, that's that's a driver. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know, you find a lot of people who start charities, they start them because the charity that they started, they lost their child or they were an alcoholic mm -hmm. or something like yeah. that. So. Um, you get some people who get beat down on their lack of opportunities and you get other people that use them as a driver. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm, like you, I love reading autobiographies, mm -hmm. Red Lord Sugars. I love Total Recall by Arnold Schwarzenegger. I love that one. And um, most of them have these voids in areas of their life that they want to fill. Because mm -hmm. if, if you get to the day where you're as rich as your uncle and then you don't feel like you need money anymore, then what are you going to do next? You, you mm -hmm. know, the... the the drive and the motivation might go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, then another void might form in your life, like you know, wanting to start a family or, mm -hmm. or something like that. So um, yeah, I like what you did there. You threw it back on me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm supposed to be interviewing you. <laughs> All right, well, we've got this new iPad. Look at that. It's a 40,000 inch. Um, that's question one done, by the yeah. way. <laughs> All right, so um, what was the hardest thing about doing The Apprentice? Um, the hardest thing for me was probably leaving my business. Yeah. So at that point we had seven. How long is it? Sorry. Um, it was about nine weeks, yeah. nine to ten weeks. Mm -hmm. I went for. At that point we had seven staff. I was the main man, um, running everything. You yeah. know, I had one part-time lady in my office. Yeah. We had a home. We had about two thousand home contract at that point, delivering maintenance. Yeah. I was the sales, the marketeer, yeah. the organizer, yeah. the complaints, the health and safety, <laughs> yeah. everything. You know, yeah. night and day. And for me, I literally went on Sunday night, my phone went off and I didn't turn it back on for 10 weeks. Wow. I disappeared off the face of the planet and yeah. nobody knew where I went. 
Yeah, and you're not allowed to say. And you? I'm not allowed to say. Yeah. So luckily, I had an amazing person around me, and she's still with me now. Her name's Debbie. Yeah. Um, and basically, she was working three days a week, and I approached her and I said, "Look, I've got this opportunity. I'm going to win if I go. Yeah. Um, so can you step up and do- take this for me? Yeah. I promise you, the day I become a millionaire, your retirement is made. <laughs> I will look after you until the yeah. end. Yeah. Can you do it for me?" And she said, "Yeah, I'll do it for you. Go. I know you can do it as yeah. well." So then she went, and that was probably the hardest thing. Okay, can can I just jump on that? Mm -hmm. Um, Because every entrepreneur I've ever met, myself included, you get to the point where you're doing everything. Mm -hmm. And there's a point where you think, how do I grow? Mm -hmm. How do I get out? How do I step up? You know, you step up, scale. Yeah. Um, And so many people think they can't leave their business Mm -hmm. because they think it will fail. And... I think that was probably one of the greatest gifts to your business Mm -hmm. to scale. Yeah. Because you had no choice. Mm -hmm. I'm going to make a little guess that if you didn't have The Apprentice, in that 10 weeks, you wouldn't have turned your phone off yourself Mm -hmm. and done nothing for 10 weeks. Yeah, exactly. You just stayed in your business, wouldn't you? And so your business could be at 10 people now and you could have still been doing everything. Mm -hmm. But you were forced out because of an opportunity. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I think if people do that to themselves, like make themselves go on holiday, they'll be able to scale quicker. Yeah. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think 100%. You know, that was probably one of the greatest gifts mm. as well because I realised that actually I don't need to be doing everything. You think that every decision needs to live and die on your word yeah. and that you have to answer every customer mm. and all of that type of stuff. But, yeah. you know, it does run. It does run without you. And now yeah. I can take time away to do this type of stuff. And it what it did allow me to scale quicker yeah. because then you get a taste for it, yeah. I think. Yeah. Then you get a, a taste for delegation yeah, yeah. and you don't want to do everything yourself. No. Because I say, you do that, get on with that, right, I need you to do this for yeah. me. And then all of a sudden, you know, you're just the puppeteer and you're controlling yeah. everybody else and you don't have to do all yeah. of these things. Yeah. So, you know, it was, it was a great gift and mm. it is hard, it's so hard to walk away from something that you've created at such an early stage yeah. because I suppose it's like having a kid. Yeah. You want to nurture it through every single step of its yeah. journey. Yeah. Um, you know, but yeah, no, it was, a, it was a great gift. Yeah. I think a lot, a lot of entrepreneurs, you know, they, they, they're like, I'm going to work 20 hours a day, you know, yeah. wear it like a badge of honor. I'm not going to take a holiday for three years or whatever. Yeah. I'd say do the opposite. I don't, I don't think people have a real business unless they can leave it because mm-hmm. they're just self-employed, but they're their own self-employed boss. Yeah. Um, so people should book holidays mm-hmm. and they should plan for those holidays and they should plan to turn the phone off and they should have, you know, staff, systems, people mm-hmm. to run the business without them. Yeah. And um, if I look at the, our journey of growth, um, when we've had new trainers in to run events I used to run, uh, we used to run them as tests when we were in Cayman Islands mm-hmm. or the America or Dubai. Because when you're away, you can't. You, you, you can't. Yeah, like yeah. You could, for 10 weeks, you couldn't. Because yeah. I bet if you could have had your phone, you'd have had a little sneak. Yeah, and yeah. all of a sudden, <laughs> 50 emails later. Yeah, you, you've, you've been dragged back yeah. into a problem. How many years was it that you found like you could st- finally sort of get out of doing stuff? Did well, it take a couple of years? There was a, uh, for me, there was one moment because I've read The E-Myth, I've read Built to Sell, yeah. you know, I've read a lot of the books on scaling, mm-hmm. um, even when I wasn't scaling. And even though we had staff, there was still a lot of things I was doing. And um, I, I always used to think that it's all about hard work and if mm-hmm. I work 15, 20 hours a day, it's only ever going to be short term and that made me a successful mm-hmm. entrepreneur. And we'd had my son Bobby and he was about nine months old. Mm-hmm. And I was still, even though I'd made quite a lot of money, I'd become a millionaire by then. I was still working a lot and I used to live on Park Road which is you know, obviously mm-hmm. just leading into town and the offices were in town and I'd sometimes, I'd sometimes go to work before he got up and I'd come back and he was in bed mm-hmm. and Gemma sat me down and said oh it's great we've got this lifestyle I'm really proud of you but if you don't see your son he's going to be 18 mm-hmm. and you're not going to know who he is mm-hmm. and that really fucking scared me because mm-hmm. I did not want to be that parent I didn't I, I, you know I'd, I'd rather be just on the bread line but be a great dad mm-hmm. than be a millionaire and not know my son mm-hmm. Um, and you've obviously got that to look forward to, mm. um, but because something physically changes when you're you're a parent, you're not a parent, are you? No, yeah. No. And um, <laughs> I'm ten years older than you. I felt like old. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and so that that, that was great. a bit like you had to go away for ten weeks. Yeah, yeah. You know, Gemma put she put it in a nice way, but she basically said you need to see your son. Yeah. And um, yeah, so I basically uh, that was my that was like my why. Mm-hmm. You know, the pain. Yeah, yeah. Is yeah. The motivator. And yeah, just um, every time you sort of step back, there's always some growing pains, but you yeah. always get over it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like customers, they're complaining and they want they want Joe, mm-hmm. but then when they have, what's your name, De- Debbie, did you say? Debbie, or yeah. Else? 
actually they realise actually Deb is quite nice. Yeah, and actually yeah. she can deal with it in a different way. And and often often people are better than you, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. Because your ego doesn't yeah. want to admit that. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah. yeah. And that's exactly what happened. Mm. All of a sudden, when I got back and I got back on the phone, if I, was, I answered the phone for the first time and they were like, oh, where you been? And I used an excuse that I had to go to Italy because yeah. a mem- member of my family wasn't very well. Yeah. And um, I'd sort of disappeared and they had yeah. no signal or Wi-Fi because mm. it was on a farm. But mm. um, basically I came back and said, oh, we don't want to talk to you no more. We want to talk to Debbie. Yeah. Or yeah. can I speak to Debbie? And then all of a sudden you think, oh, brilliant. Yeah. She's, you know, she's done yeah. really, really well and it's having that little bit of trust. But you're always going to get, like you just said, those little teething problems. Yeah. Oh, look, this has gone wrong. Well, you ain't done this. And it's so easy to go. And I've been guilty of it in the past. You know, get on the phone. Why the hell have you done this? Yeah. Like, what a stupid decision to <laughs> yeah. make. You've like, you've wrecked this or whatever else. Yeah. And then you think, hang on, look, people have got to make these mistakes. Mm-hmm. And as long as you set the barriers, you know, give them an idea of what to do in these situations and learn from it, yeah. then, you know, you've got to be able to let them make those mistakes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, so they learn yeah. as well, and not absolutely destroy them over it. Mm. You know, which is which is quite important, and yeah. I've been guilty of doing that in the past. Yeah, I think um, you can take everything personally, can't you, about yeah. your business? You know, and anything that happens, you can always feel like, well, that's a reflection of me. Mm-hmm. And yeah, that you know, my fiance used to she used to work for me for about five years, and um, she'd come home and say stuff, and she's just have an event. Hmm. But I'm sitting there thinking, this is my business. You're, you know, <laughs> ripping to bits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then we'd rip it each other to bits. Yeah. Because then I don't get any for about a month. Yeah. And then, and then it's, it's all a nightmare. Anyway, we'll move on on, on that one. <laughs> so, so you said the hardest thing about doing the Apprentice was being away from your business for ten weeks. Yeah. But what was the hardest thing in the Apprentice? Um, or the most challenging thing, or the thing that pushed you the most to grow? Um, I mean, staying in staying in the room. I'm a very very light sleeper. Yeah. So I was in a room with like five guys. Like boarding uh, school. Yeah, yeah, pretty much like boarding yeah. school. Um, yeah, and staying in the room with five guys and then trying to get to sleep every night and dealing with that pressure. Yeah. So I think knowing one of the main things was knowing at any moment that could be your last day. Mm. And then as the days went on, it became more and more precious, and yeah. the more and more that you didn't want to lose. Yeah. And always having that in the back of your mind. If I mess up or fail or do something here that's mm. gonna, you know, this could jeopardise my chances. Mm. So it was like that endurance race. I suppose it's like when it's a Formula One guy driving around the track. He knows if he makes one wrong move on that steering wheel, he's going into the barrier, yeah. and then that's his race over. Yeah. And it's you know having that in your mind the whole time was pretty tough to deal with. Yeah. Um, another great lesson I learned from it was dealing with egos. Yeah. Because in my business that I was the people I was managing, nobody really ever answers me back. No. You know, and they sort of do what you say. Yeah. But then you're in a position where people are just as strong as you. Yeah. And you know to then have to manage them and try and make them work as a team was good for me. Yeah. Because that helped to build me. And what tips would you give? On that then dealing with uh, egos how did you manage to control it I think it's it's giving that person enough room to make them feel like they've got control of that situation but you still control the situation if that makes sense so if one of the guys is really good at marketing okay let him run with it and do it and then put that responsibility back onto them yeah you know, and delegate that role. Okay, you want to take the marketing, you take the marketing. Yeah. If you don't deliver what you've told me you're going to deliver, then when it comes to the chopping block, you're coming with me. <laughs> Simple as that. Yeah. Give them that responsibility. Yeah. And I say that to people that work for me now. Yeah. You know, you don't have to do everything, my manager. You don't have to take all of the responsibility. We have people that work in the business, so they become a master of their role. Yeah. You know, and give them back that responsibility. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the easiest way. Because yeah. as soon as you try and pull it all away from people and treat them like babies or like yeah. idiots, they'll act yeah. like them. Yeah. And then they suddenly can't make a decision or answer anything for themselves. Yeah. It's all about responsibility, sink or swim. Yeah. You know, straight into the deep end. Yeah. Yeah. Much like business and life, it sounds yeah. like. Okay. So um, one thing I've, I've thought of about The Apprentice recently, and you can, you can put me down in flames if you think I'm, <laughs> I'm wrong here, but I've thought over the years, except yourself, of course, they've, they've, they've maybe got people on the show for the ego, for the drama, maybe a bit more than getting a load of really good business people on. Yeah. Is that, I mean, is that I fair think, to say I or think, not? I think it's fair to say. Yeah, yeah I do. I mean, when, I'm, when you watch the first, the first few years of The Apprentice were very serious, yeah. I think. But then, you know, like any type of television show, Although it's about business, it's about the audience. Mm. It's about making it exciting and fun yeah. for them to watch, yeah. you know, and, and, and making and making um, 
you know, different situations and bringing in people with egos yeah. because that's how it becomes eventually. Because if not, it just becomes very samey. Yeah. So they did bring people in, with egos in and, you know, and that's, that's, um, yeah. that's what they probably do to keep, to keep the concept alive. Yeah. Well, if you were to change anything about it, what would you change? But the format of the show or how it's going? The amount of money that you win. Oh, right. yeah. <laughs> a lot more. Million than quid that. would be nice. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I that, hope they don't change that this year because yeah. I'll be fuming. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you, um, you got 250 grand's worth of investment, is that yeah, right? Yeah, 250 grand's worth of investment. And, and yeah. how much of your soul, I mean your company, did you have to give away for that? So 50%. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. So 50% for that. So now Lord Sugar owns 50% of the business. Yeah. 50% of the shares. Yeah. The money goes straight in. And then. You can pretty much, you know, you do get so the whole thing. It, it didn't come in, ch- in tranches, it came all in one lump. It comes all in one lump, yeah. Because yeah, cause normally with uh, kind of VC money, it comes in yeah. tranches and you've got to meet criteria. Yeah, it comes all in one lump. Yeah. And then basically, you obviously have to, you can't just take the money, yeah. everything's countersigned. And, yeah. You know, you have to justify why you need that X amount of money against yeah. your plan for whatever reason. Yeah. Um, but it is all hits the bank account in one, in one go. Yeah. And, uh, Sounds like a lot of money. Bet it didn't last that long. Um, we've still got some left. Oh, right. Yeah, and how long has it been now? Since uh, it's been show? seven months. Right. It's been seven months. But our biggest investment in the last seven months has been in people. Yeah. And we've been needing, we needed to scale. Yeah. Okay, so we can get the work and all of that type of stuff. That's not a problem. We had a lot of the computer systems and everything yeah. else. But it was removing me. Yeah. So like I said to you, when I came back last year, although Debbie was great... Mm. To, to be able to scale continuously, and Debbie's retiring soon, I needed to bring in a solid manager, yeah. solid supervisor, more people in the business so we can we, we can have them to grow on top of. Yeah. So when we start to bring the work, because I'm great at bringing in work, I can get lots of work all of Most the time. Most entrepreneurs are good at the sales and the marketing. Yeah. They're, they're terrible at the back of Exactly, yeah. yeah. And that's when I realized early part of the year, because you imagine we had so much opportunity, yeah. early part of the year, all of a sudden I'm like, yes, we'll have that, 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 yeah. that, and that. Yeah. Like I went shopping on yeah. contract. <laughs> you know, but then all of a sudden, I forgot that I'd built on a small foundation yeah. with systems that weren't scalable. Yeah. We were on, we were using paper systems, putting job sheets in folders, yeah. and that was our, you know, process like that. Yeah. Now we've got a computerized job management system yeah. and CRM and scheduling, and yeah. got a manager and all of that type of stuff. And if not, we're anything, we're overstaffed in our office. Yeah. But now we can build on it. Yeah. And you know, we've got at least another twenty-four months of a lot more work that can go on to our existing um, yeah. overhead of people. Yeah. So a couple of things on that then. Um, and I want to ask you both so I remind myself to ask the second one. So the first one is it'd be interesting to know how you propose to spend that quarter of a million mm-hmm. quid. Uh, and then um, over hiring or staffing up. So they're the two mm-hmm. next questions because they're not written down because we're now on question two. Uh, of all of that, <laughs> you've not got anything to do for the next one. No, week, no, no, we're okay. Yeah. Yeah, we're all good. Good. So, um, yeah, where, how, how did you propose to invest the the money in terms of the business plan? So, what the, areas? The money for us was at firstly about our, our offices. Yeah. Um, so we had a warehouse, but it needed it needed a mezzanine floor put in it. It needed some extra rooms um, and all of that type of stuff. So we've invested with that. We've put money into that. Yeah. Now I've created a sales office, a scheduling management office, and you know, and a boardroom yeah. and all of that did, stuff. Did they retain ownership of the building with that or did that just... Yeah, so basically we lease our building. Yeah, right. So yeah, we lease it over three yeah. years. So when we leave, we either take it down yeah. or we let them have it. Yeah. And basically, but we didn't spend a massive amount on it, but yeah. we, we spent enough for us to be able to stay in that building for the next yeah. three years. Next, it was basically on our scheduling and management system. So we needed something that could capture all of our customers' data and book and schedule and record yeah. all of our legal um, gas safe yeah. and all of that type was, of forms. Did you get one bespoke written or was that an off-the-shelf program? Um, we found a real great one called Job Watch. Oh, okay. um, yeah, and it's by a company called Big Change Apps. And yeah. basically, you can use that system and you can develop the system. Yeah. So it goes with... Um, logistical companies, lorry companies, they have it for sales organizations, they have it for our industry, electrical companies, maintenance companies, right. and it's got a lot of standard criteria, so it can do um, fuel reports, uh, margin mm. reports, financial reports, time reports, how long they're on jobs for, yeah. and then you can bespoke it and adapt it working with that developer. Right. So that one became our yeah. became our best, um, best choice. Right. So we've got that in, that took quite a lot of time and another yeah. lesson if I can put that out there to people yeah. is when you get one of these things it is do your due diligence on it and make yeah. sure it's right for your yeah, business because they'll all sell you this is the system that's yeah. going to be amazing and change your business and change your life yeah. and then it doesn't work exactly yeah. and then it doesn't work and I think we trialled five 
and we did pick the best one, but we made a mistake, which I've learned from, and we basically thought we knew enough about the system yeah. to implement it right. from their training. Right. And they gave us two days training to implement this system. Me being eager and my manager being yeah. eager, yeah. we were like, right, we know this 100%. Let's go full on into it. We're going to yeah. do scheduling appointments, <laughs> yeah. job sheets. We're going to do all of our invoicing, yeah. all of our quotes. Two weeks later at 12 a.m., we were sitting in our office like, what have we done? Yeah. You know, we'd gone way too far into it. Yeah. We chucked literally overnight our whole business into this computerized yeah. system without doing it in sections. Yeah. And then we had to pull out. Yeah. I said, right, we're pulling out invoicing, we're pulling out quoting, yeah. we're just doing this and we're perfecting it and getting it right. Yeah. So when you get one of these things, if you don't know 100% how to use it, don't yeah. chuck your whole business into it. There's nothing wrong with doing it in segments yeah. and perfecting one area. So the yeah. logistics, then the quoting, then the invoicing, yeah. for example, yeah. and making sure it's planned and, and um, strategized, yeah. you know, and get a full implementation plan off yeah. of your software provider. Yeah. Don't just let them come and demo it again and then yeah. go all in. Mm. Yeah, you know what? Um, I've got loads of stories about that. And um, it still scars me to this day. We did, um, in fact, it might have been the Lord Sugar Property Super Conference we did. We did a Property Super Conference and um, this company came and showcase this brand new event system mm -hmm. uh, where they had you know people would have, wear a lanyard with their name they'd have a little barcode and they had little scanners and we give them their name badge when they come in and we scan them and when they come up and want to buy something you just scan like mm -hmm. that and the money's in your bank and all this yeah. won't be amazing and we got there and the whole thing fucked up at the start we had a thousand people outside Wembley couldn't get in all kicking off massive thing we had to write the system off in the first morning we didn't use it for the rest of the weekend Funny. and yeah and actually we did test it on a smaller event but I think when you're bringing in new systems you've got to have a period where you're testing it kind of like in a sort of non-live situation mm -hmm. and then you've got to have an integration period mm -hmm. where you're bringing it in like you said maybe start with one thing before you dump everything on the system yeah. and yeah so I could just back that up it seems like a lot of people have these problems yeah you know it does because the thing is your mind goes I've got a problem that looks like the solution. I'll have it. Yeah, yeah. And let's do it now. Yeah. And, you know, because you get these happy eyes and ears, don't you? That that's going to be the be all and end all. Yeah, yeah. But like when you meet a new girl or man, and you think, ah, oh, they're not like my ex at all. They're going to be. <laughs> and then three months yeah, later, when you really get point. to know them. Yeah. yeah. So okay, so let's go back to the question, which was, how did you spend the money? Mm -hmm. So you also, you said you spent on staff. Yeah. So yeah, we spent a lot on staff, and that was all about. You know, having enough money, having enough money to pay the wages, mm. because they're always going to be me running alongside a manager. Didn't need both of us, mm. but twelve months it will need yeah. just it will need both of us, so I can carry on with the new business development, and he can run the business for me yeah. or manage the manage the office. Yeah. You know, so there's a period of time there where you're paying two people's wages to do the same yeah. job for six months, yeah. and then the same with our scheduling and management team. We really could have had one person in there, mm. but we've had two because we've got to have two in case one goes away. Yeah. And then as we start to bring on more work, then we've got the scope to grow with it. Yeah. Um, you know, so having, having extra staff and that the cash has been good to buy us time. Yeah. Because when I was smaller, there's no way I could have brought a manager on. Yeah. So I wouldn't have had the cash to pay their wages mm -hmm. while we were trying to build the business yeah. at that point. You know, so that's been it's been heavily invested in people, which obviously doesn't give you an instant return. Yeah. So even though you know it's paying their wages, it's still investment. Even yeah. though you've not bought a physical item, mm -hmm. you've invested in their training and their time and all of that type of stuff. So yeah. that's that's been um, that's been quite a challenge over the last sort of seven months. But we are there now, which has been great. And now the business is mm -hmm. is fully functioning. Um, we invested in un all new uniform and tools and, yeah. and vans. We've got some all brand new vans and all that type yeah. of stuff on the road now. Um, and realistically, that's it. I mean, that's what we spent on. Now the rest of it we're using for cash flow, and we've got a couple of other things lined up. Um, we've launched something called Installer Elite Network, which is basically bringing all of the independent installers in the UK underneath one identity, yeah. um, which I control, and then that uses up, that allows me to then go to suppliers and wholesalers and manufacturers, and yeah. in a sense have a lot more buying power than what I would have done just under Impregas, yeah. and then negotiate better warranties and all of that type of stuff. So that's worked quite well, and um, that's been quite investment free though, to be fair, something I've built just off the contacts that I made. Yeah. Um, so I'm working on that. I know you've got them progressive property network, so it might be nice yeah. after just to get a little bit of feedback on from you on that and how you did it. Sure. Um, yeah. But yeah, yeah so, no so, so that's going on. Yeah. 
And now for us, like I said, in the last seven months, we, we had a business model that I built Impregas on for the last three years. And then it became to a point where the market that we were in, we were outgrowing our market and we didn't have a place in it anymore because we were expanding. Mm. And really, they don't have companies of this size in that rental market. Yeah. So it became a point where I had to you completely change the direction of Impregas. So mm. I've done that in the last seven months. And that was a hard yet brave decision to make yeah. because I'd built this business. All I'd known was property management the last four years. I'd spent time building with the Countrywide and the Sequence Homes and everybody else and, and making those networks. And then I had to say, look, I can't fit this market anymore and give yeah. it back yeah. and, and change the business model. So, yeah. But that was the best decision we ever made. Yeah, and why? Why was it the best decision? Because we simplified our model, yeah. simplified our model. Yeah. We were trying to be too many things, yeah. trying to be electricians, we were trying to be plumbers, we were trying yeah. to be service, maintenance, breakdown. We were trying to cater new build, social yeah. housing, private homeowner, business to business market. Yeah. And all of a sudden we were being quiet, we were being average at every single yeah. one. Yeah. Yeah. And I was sick of it and I wanted to basically become a master of one sector, simplify that model and become the best. Yeah. So now basically rather than doing 300 jobs a month, we're doing 50 boiler installations a month. Yeah. But we're earning five times the amount of yeah. money and then that allows us to home in and start to improve every fine detail yeah. so that we can be the best boiler installation business in mm. our market yeah. because we're not constantly being busy fools and we now have time to perfect that, yeah. perfect that model. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think that's a great lesson because um, I think most entrepreneurs want multiple streams of income. Yep. You know, they want to they want to think that they're doing a lot of things. Um, I think people get it the wrong way around. Um, if you become the best thing in a specific niche, you build a brand around being the best at that. Mm -hmm. Then you can diversify. Yeah, yeah. You know, if you think of like the Coca Cola company, how many different soft drinks and yep. products they have, but it, it would have been for decades Coke, Coca Cola. Um, yeah, so yeah. I just think it's, it's good advice. Yeah, because I think you can just think all of a sudden you like you get that bug. Mm. Second, you're in business, you're like, oh, I can make an opportunity out of that, I make yeah. one out of that. And every opportunity that I've, I've always tried, you know, some of them have been good, but others have just got me way distracted. Yeah, yeah. From year two, I'm, I started a maintenance company, a building company, yeah. and I ran it for 12 months. And even though we made quite a bit of money out of it, we were doing a lot of property refurbs and all of that because of my property management connections. All of a sudden, I had this team of 10, 10 um, builders. We were doing cleaning, locks, um, gardening, everything yeah. you can think of. But then we were falling down in a lot of areas using mm. subcontracts, and it was going to end up pulling the whole Impra brand down because yeah, yeah. I'd spread myself way too thin. Yeah. I was losing the plot because yeah. I was doing seven days a week. Yeah. You know, I was I was stressed out to the absolute max. Yeah. And, um, and then the th you, you end up ruining the things that are going well because you're burned out. Yeah, yeah. exactly right. Yeah. Mm. So, you know, like you just said, probably took Coca Cola decades to build that brand. Yeah. And I was so eager at that point, I thought that I could do everything. Oh, everybody needs lots of, say, lots of things to make money. You need to bring it on now. And mm. that's another thing that I've learned as a, from my own personal thing is, is patience. Yeah. I yeah. never had any, yeah. but now I know <laughs> yeah. that things will take time. Yeah. And Do you know, I never, I never really say that because I don't want people to think I'm an old bastard yeah. now, <laughs> or, or kind of demean how I was when I was younger. Yeah, but I completely agree as well. You know, learn to say no to stuff, or say yes but not now, or yes in six yeah. months, and yeah, just it's nothing wrong with slowing down a little bit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. So let's go back to the uh, hiring up. Because mm -hmm. about five years ago, we changed our recruitment policy. And instead of always trying to sort of, re you know, get value mm -hmm. and only hire a new person when we really needed it, mm -hmm. we've got the opposite policy now, which is we have rolling recruitment, i.e. we're always hiring. Mm -hmm. And we want to get to the point where we're uh, overhired if we can, mm -hmm. although we rarely ever get there. Because mm -hmm. as soon as you are actually fully hired, someone leaves, yeah. something changes, or you need a new role. Mm -hmm. Um, so it sounds like you've got the same thing mm -hmm. where you're looking to rather than have a system which can't grow mm -hmm. you pay a bit more up front to have a, a system that can take on three years of growth and more people that can take on more contracts yeah, yeah, yeah. and then grow that way yeah because I think sort of like early stages you need to maximise every pound yes. and every hour out yeah. of a person yeah. so say having that role in recruitment you know that okay there may be a month of time where then we're not going to get 100% out of them and that's going to cost us yeah. from a revenue perspective but at the same time it's going to benefit 
in a lot more areas because yeah. you do find to the point where oh no right actually now we're so busy yeah. we've got so many jobs on we need an engineer now yeah. Yeah. so you're hiring on demand rather than yeah. you know and we, yeah we, we are we are still quite reactive as well yeah. you know but we are working on having that rolling recruitment process yeah. where we know that every time we bring on a salesperson yeah. and month in the, down the line when they're fully trained we're going to need a full time engineer yeah. so it's a lot more planned and structured rather than yeah. uh oh we've just realised that we're way too busy or somebody's left we need somebody yeah okay cool so can we start talking a bit about um, the upsides and downsides of raising the money mm -hmm. and the upsides and downsides of working with Lord Sugar yeah I get the impression you're quite similar to me in that well you said it you don't really like being told what to do yeah so the upside of a quarter of a million quid in Lord Sugar mm -hmm. well tell us what are the upsides of that so, I mean, the upsides of it and the whole process was the exposure. Yeah. Um, I set out on that journey, so the pit, so the world, I say the world, mm. the world would know who I was and to be noticed yeah. and to open up avenues that I couldn't do before. You know, so that's been a massive upside. We've yeah. created some great relationships in our industry with manufacturers, wholesalers. We've got access to deals that we could only have dreamed of before, yeah. you know, from all different types and, of business and services. And the show and Lord Sugar's really helped that, has it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the show and Lord Sugar, that's maximised that because yeah. without it, I wouldn't have had it. Yeah. So it's opened up that world. Obviously, having the investment has given us the time and the money to scale the business to invest in the people yeah. and to buy that period of time where we need to grow it's yeah. given us the ability to increase increase our um increase our staff yeah. and improve on our vans and okay. our tools rather than driving around in sure. 400 quid second hand vans that we used yeah. to as i was growing and it's what i could afford yeah. We're now driving around in brand new volkswagen transporters that look amazing but in and 10 years when you're doing tens of millions of pounds a year yeah lord sugar's getting half of that yeah yeah, yeah. But without that, it would have took me 10 years to get where I am now, maybe. Yeah. Probably not that long, but it, it's, 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 it's sped it up so quickly. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so would you have done the same thing if it wasn't the show and Lord Sugar that came with it? I.e. it was a, a family relative who put 250 grand in for half the money. Would you have done it then? Sorry, for half the company. Um... Or do you think the deal sealer was the apprentice and Lord Sugar. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the 250 grand is great, but it's not, you know, a massive game yeah. changer in business. No. You know, it's, it's, it's a good bit of well, investment. Our monthly overheads about that. So, yeah. yeah. So it's basically what, it's, what it could buy. I wanted to be noticed and I knew that that would make yeah. that work. Mm. Um, so, you know, for me, it was about that. If it was family that was going to give me 250 grand, probably not because doing things with family for me have never worked out. <laughs> Yeah, I'm in business in the last few well, You're half Italian, aren't yeah. you? So, yeah. Yeah. so we tried a few different things, but you know, I think keeping that okay, is what, separate. What about a random investor, but you didn't get the show and the exposure and the marketing and Lord Sugar? You got a VC who, same deal, but no one knew about who they were. Yeah, it them? depends what else they were going to give me. If they were going to be an so investor. You wouldn't do it just for the money then? No, not just for the money, no. Because I didn't need just the yeah. money. I needed. I what, needed sorry, just to quickly sorry. jump in, no, yeah. my, my fault. Because. Uh, Part of my brain's going when you're talking about this. Yeah. Oh, well, Joey can do it because he's got 250 grand investment. Yeah, yeah. And I don't want people to hear think that they can't do what you're doing because they haven't got that. Yeah. And I want them to know the downsides of that. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So you wouldn't have done it if it was just a quarter of a million, but no. No, because I wanted also the mentorship, mm. you know. And but I do want, you get that? And I wanted the support. Yeah, yeah. You, get, you get it, yeah. I mean, but Lord Sugar's obviously a very busy man. Yeah. And he does, and he does make it clear on the show that you'll be doing all the work. So you know he's not there sitting with you. For, How often do you get to speak to him? So once a month. Yeah. We get to see him for an hour, or that's, I get to see him for an that, hour. That's still valuable. Yeah, an I hour. Mean, would I pay a quarter of a million pound a year to be mentored by someone like Lord Sugar? I'd probably pay that. Yeah. I'd probably pay a quarter of a million pound of my own money. Yeah. Just to get one hour a month with him because yeah, I really yeah. believe in having a mentor. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. So that's been you know very good. very valuable you know yeah. and having that. Being in his presence and spending time with yeah. him and, and just learning, you know, yeah. all of that type of thing helps me to grow, mm. you know, and, and a mentorship was another thing that I wanted from it. Yeah. So if it was just 250K, then no. Yeah. Because then I've got 250 grand and it's all great. And, but you know, as soon, yeah, as soon as you start making good money, you, for the next 10 years when they're doing nothing for that money, you could, you could start regretting that, couldn't yeah. you? Yeah. But I would never regret this decision. No. no because it's put me on a platform. Yeah. Platform, next platform. Um, and, yeah. and you know and Do, is your creativity or decision making restricted um, not you know, you're really account, you're as, long, as long as you can justify it yeah. yeah I think you know as long as you can justify the decision that you're going to make 
he's not going to say no. no. And that's purely because he's not a um, expert in my industry. No. I know my market, I know our products, I know how people work, I know mm. what customers need to see, I know you know how it all runs. Yeah. He doesn't. Yeah. He knows how business works yeah. and the sectors that he's been used to growing is growing in and he's built in. Yeah. You know, he doesn't know anything about the plumbing and heating game. He's not a service industry man. Yeah. You know, so mm. for me I wanted the business mentorship yeah. and how to grow and scale an organization yeah. rather than, you know, your sugar tell me how to best to package this board of installation. Yeah. Or whatever it was. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Okay. Does that cool. answer the question? Well, yeah, yeah. yeah. I just um I think people have this illusion, don't they, that, um, hey, let's get money into our business, it will solve all the problems, there's yeah. no downside, and just... It, yeah, I think yeah. you've got to know how to spend it. Yeah. And have and it you're struck. accountable to someone else. Yeah, exactly right, yeah. Mm. Okay. We should do another one of these in a few years. Yeah, That'd sounds good. good to me. Um, yeah, I just... Um, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, I'd just be really interested to see how it goes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, cool. Good. So... What advice would you give your 22-year-old self? What advice would I give my 22-year-old yeah. self? Um, build a, a stronger foundation yeah. that, that you can scale on. Yeah. Okay, have, system, uh, have systems and procedures in place yeah. that can grow. Don't get too big and then realize that you've got to scale back again yeah. to be able to implement them because it makes it twice as hard. And like we sort of touched on before, was having those patience. Yeah. You know, I just, I've because of my short attention span, I'm constantly grabbing at things and looking for the next thing, and then I didn't give all of my attention to one specific area. Yeah. So starting that maintenance company and trying some property investments and all of that type of stuff, I was going all over the place. Yeah. When I'd been in very business a very short amount of time, so I spent more time working on that one key thing and yeah. get it amazing. Then when it's self-sufficient and it's running very, very well and it's very profitable, then you can look to expand on that. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Okay. Great. Is there anything that you believe in or do that other people disagree with regarding business or your business? I think the the thing that I do is 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 back, touching back on the belief of where the business can go. I think when people you say to somebody that we are going to be the UK's largest boiler installation business in the country, yeah. they look at me as if I'm crazy. Yeah. I'm looking at I'm looking at them and telling them that it's already happened. Yeah. We're just working our way towards it. Yeah. So I think people don't agree with where I think I can take this. Yeah. You know, sometimes and mm. and that's probably the only the only thing really. Yeah your vision and you you already see that it's there yeah and how yeah. big how big and how much potential it actually has yeah i say that's not everybody and everybody in our organization is on board with me and is is, is following that path but yeah. um other than that no not really i'm just going to read this as i've written it i i was probably on something when i wrote this <laughs> if you could time travel back to day one of your business and have a 15 minute with your former self to communicate any lessons you've acquired with the intention of saving yourself mistakes and heartache, what would you tell yourself? In fact, I haven't, I haven't written that, but let's have a go with that. <laughs> Similar to the last one, let, let me say one more time for you, because it's a bit of a mouthful. Yeah. I'd just like to test new things on this program. If you could time travel back to day one of your business and have a 15 minute with your former self to communicate any lessons you've acquired with the intention of saving yourself mistakes and heartache, what would you say to yourself? Plan better. Yeah. Plan. Um, plan plan what you're going to plan your budget and have a strong financial plan over the coming years yeah. and exceed it or stick to it mm -hmm. um, at the beginning when I started Impregas I came from somebody that was an engineer and you know you read in the e-myth engineers start engineering businesses yeah. people start this businesses or whatever else I didn't know anything about accounts yeah. and that was a massive downside to me first time I went to the accountant he was like oh you've made this much you've made profit I was like bloody hell that's good yeah. showing me all of these forms I didn't really know what they were yeah. the P&L the balance sheet mm. and it took me uh, probably about two and a half years till I understood them 
and actually spent time learning what they meant. Yeah. But they're, they're the main things that drive mm. your business. You've been, you're the numbers drive it. Yeah. You know, and until you've got that bit solid, mm. then having all these hair-brained ideas and chasing stuff and all of that type of stuff is great. But who's going to fund it? Yeah. Where's the money coming from? Mm. When are you going to run out of money? Yeah. You know, and knowing all that. Type, how much are you going to make? Mm. Oh yeah, that's a brilliant idea, and the customer's going to love it. But are you going to make money out of it? Yeah. Or you're just going to be doing it for the sake of doing it. Yeah. And then you know, once you know that then it justifies what you're going to spend your time on. Sure. And I was very good at doing all of the other bits I just yeah. said, busy but never full. planning yeah. this bit. Yeah. You know, and understanding it, yeah, being busy full, yeah. starting a call centre, going on yeah. a maintenance company, property, you know, whatever it was. Yeah. But now I've pulled right back. I look at my budget every single night. I know yeah. it off the back of my hand. Yeah. Exactly what move we're going to make, when we're going to make it, when the money's coming in, when we're going to lose the money, when yeah. the mar- what margin we've got on every single job. Okay. If people don't have 250 grand and Lord Sugar, mm-hmm. what can you say to them that can help them grow and scale their business? Mm-hmm. But they don't have the money or the brand that you do. Um, I think, obviously, number one, the key ingredient being hard work. That's the only way you're going to scale is by working hard towards it. Getting the right people around you and experienced people, like you said before about mentors and having people that can advise you to take the business in the right area. If finance is something that you're after, for me, I started with taking out a personal loan because I was on a good wage. Yeah. Okay, that was my choice of funding at the time because yeah. I wanted the money quickly. Yeah. But look at crowdfunding, search yeah. for an investor, mm. um, you know, and, and there's quite a few different things out there that you can get. You yeah. can get, try a business business loan from the bank, even that's a lot more of a long-winded process and, yeah. you know, they want to see your plan and all of that type of stuff. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, Really, it can only grow organically or you look for investment and you look for people that can bring something that you don't have. Mm -hmm. Bring on a partner or team up with another organization that's similar to yours. Yeah. You know, or that's that's really the only way. Do you agree or? Yeah, I think um, the other way to do it is through cash flow by selling stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, So I think I agree with everything you said. It's just the way we did it was Mm -hmm. when we started we had a product that was quite a high fee Mm -hmm. and some of the fee was um, for future delivery. Mm -hmm. So um, this was something that Dell uh, completely almost rewrote the rule books because if you think of a normal stock business, let's say like books, Mm -hmm. um, so you want to sell 10,000 books, Mm -hmm. you've got to buy 10,000 books Mm -hmm. and you know that might cost you 100,000 pounds. So 100,000 pounds out of your bank and then it, it, it might take you a year to sell all those books. So you've got like, you know, you've got a measurable cash position, but it's a minus time figure. Yeah. What, what Dell used to do is they'd sell the computer and then build it mm-hmm. and then send it out 30 days or 60 days mm-hmm. or 15 days after you paid. Mm-hmm. So they Free had, order. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Basically, it yeah. sounds like obvious now, yeah. but you know, most companies, they start, they don't take much money, they do the service, yeah. then there's 30 day terms. We were talking before we started, weren't we? You were dropping yeah. some of the work you were doing because yeah, yeah, yeah. you weren't getting much money or much money up front. Yeah. So if you could start with a contract or a, a, a model that takes fees up front, yeah. now, as long as you don't go and waste that money, you've got a um, essentially a minus days cash position yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, instead of a 30 days mm-hmm. or a 60 days and, and that's how we did it we, we, we'd build a portfolio for people for two three or five years mm-hmm. but we'd take some of the fees up front and some of them in the profit share and so you know we we're able to cash flow our business from fees up front yeah, yeah, yeah. so you know that's another way of doing it yeah yeah, yeah. And the, I'm really interested in talking about all this there's actually no right and wrong way to fund a business yeah I think if you just understand the upsides and downsides yeah so the upside of upfront money like Dell were doing, yeah. the upside of that is you're in a really strong cash flow mm-hmm. position. The downside might be that people might be a bit nervous about paying you up front. Yeah. Uh, or, or the downside might be that, you know, the, the thing you get with Lord Sugar is mentorship, accountability, mm-hmm. that kind of thing. So, yeah. Mm. So, yeah, back go, just moving back, that is, that is doing it the way that I did it was obviously the complete opposite. Mm. So, we were 30 days out. Yeah. Then they don't want to, then they, for some reason, say, oh, yeah, we're just waiting to pay or whatever. Yeah. Then it becomes 45 days. Yeah. And all of a sudden, from a small business, you're struggling to pay your, your, pay your position. Yeah. Now, our model is completely opposite. So, 
we're now cash flow positive. So when somebody has a boiler installed, they will pay the money on completion. Mm. So our terms with a merchant are over 60 days now. Yeah. So materials aren't paid for 60 days. Yeah. That means we're in a, co- a strong cash flow positive position, mm. even though we don't take the money pre-order. Yeah. Um, you know, we're still, before we have to pay the material, we're in a strong position. Yeah. Whereas before, 30, 45, 60 days, when we were buy, we were all of our profit was kept at that point. Okay, yeah. materials. Were, and then if one big supply goes bust, you 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 run out of cash. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Okay. Cool. Um, I get the feeling you love money. Yeah. I love money. <laughs> this is a nice environment because we can actually talk about loving money. Yeah, yeah. And it not being like a, a faux pas or yeah. you get judged. How important is money in business? And how? focused and motivated by money do you think you should be in business i think you should be i think that should be your main focus yeah just the so whole more re- than the customer it's the whole reason we're doing it i mean the yeah. customer's key because without the customer being number one then money won't be number one or it won't be a close number two but Did you have a joint number one yeah i think yeah. having a joint number one you have the customer to get the money yeah and you don't get the money if you don't please the customer yeah. it's as simple as that yeah and like you said people lie and they don't or they don't like saying that they love yeah. money well why do you think i work 15 hours a day yeah i'm not doing it for free yeah. i'm not doing it even though i love our customers yeah. it's not just for the love of the customer that's, that's that won't hobby. pay my bills yeah. Yeah. you know that won't get me a nice car that yeah. won't get me a house that won't get me the lifestyle that i want yeah you know so the money is driven by the customer yeah. so it's very very important success for me and achievement like i said to you before i've always felt like there's something i have to prove but the money for me is that byproduct of the success which i love to spend yeah yeah i want to live a nice life i don't want to struggle yeah. money doesn't buy your happiness but you don't see you know if you're sad it doesn't buy your happiness either no. sure okay Cool. So this podcast is called The Disruptive Entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. What does that word mean to you, disruptive? It means enter a marketplace. and It means getting expelled at school. Yeah, it means to to disrupt, really. I think, you know, in business, if you're going to come in somewhere and you're going to do something, you've got to disrupt that market. Disrupt your competition, you know, make them see that you're here. Bring in something new that everybody goes, what the hell are they doing? That's not going to work. Yeah. You know, they're crazy or, oh yeah, have you seen that they're now doing FaceTime surveys for yeah. boiler installs yeah. or they've brought on this instant quoting website where people can get a price straight away. Mm. You know, a lot of those people that are telling me all that stuff is wrong, yeah. in 10 years they'll be asking me how I did it and they'll want to know exactly how we did it. Yeah. You know, so get in and disrupt. Yeah. Mix it up, change it up and dominate. Yeah. I don't believe in competition, I believe in domination. Yeah. I yeah. think coming into that marketplace and you know trying to compete with other people is stupid mm. you come in you see what they're doing and you take over yeah. you do you approve on what they're doing you're riling me up now i want to go, <laughs> and, go and give it to them okay cool so and that's a perfect way to end because i'm aware of your time we've been going yeah. like what hour and 10 minutes already uh, <laughs> how can everyone find you follow you know more about what you do are you on social media what's your website blah, yeah blah. so um impregas is www.impregas.co.uk that tells you all about what impregas does as a business so we're the uk's number one boiler installation company yeah think boiler think impregas you can yeah. get an instant quote on there in under two can minutes you practice this haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> um twitter is at impregas limited at jo- mr joseph Valente for myself, yeah. Facebook, um, and LinkedIn. Yeah. Joe, it's been awesome. Brilliant. Thank, Thank you very, you very much, much. Rob. Appreciate your time. Cheers. Thank you. Good.